the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So help you, God. I do. Okay, Ms. Belovo. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Could you please state your name for the record? Kevin Ruggerberg. And where do you work? Lewis and Ellis Incorporated. And what is your position at Lewis and Ellis? I'm a vice president and consulting actuary. Okay. Um, can you please turn to uh, exhibit 24 of the binder? Yes. And um, do you recognize uh, exhibit oh, yes. 24? Yes, yeah, exhibit 24. It? Yes. And um, do you rec recognize that? I do. Can you tell us what it is? It is my pre filed testimony regarding these filings. Great. Um, can you briefly describe the information contained in uh, in that document? Yes, it briefly describes my educational and professional background. Uh, it describes our process of reviewing these filings, and it describes our recommendations to the board about those filings. And is the information in this document accurate and correct to the best of your knowledge? It is. Is there any information in this document you would like to change or clarify at this time? No. And do you wish to adopt this pre filed testimony as part of your testimony today? I do. Can you briefly explain your role in LE's review of this filing? Yes. I review all aspects of the filings, I direct internal analysis and uh, discussion regarding our recommendations and our information requests that we send to Blue Cross. I direct the communications between Lewis and Ellis and Blue Cross, and I contribute to the drafting of our report. And um, how do you submit your recommendations to the board? We submit our recommendations to the board in a report submitted on day 60, that is 60 days after the submission of the filing. Um, those reports are Exhibit 17 for the individual rate filing and Exhibit 18 for the small group rate filing, correct? Correct. Uh, do you have any changes to the individual report that you wish to make at this time? I do. Um, in the individual report, we opined that we believe the COVID adjustment was reasonable. That opinion was based on repeated assertions by Blue Cross that aggregate 2021 medical utilization was lower than aggregate 2019 medical utilization. After we submitted our report, we received Mr. Schultz's supplemental pre-filed testimony, which claims the contrary. So I am no longer comfortable claiming that the COVID adjustment is reasonable. However, um, we were we were aware that there seemed to be some sort of tension between the COVID adjustment and the utilization trend being assumed. Uh, and we note this in our report, and it was part of why we recommended that the utilization trend be reduced. Therefore, while this does provide additional information, and I think helps to clarify what information we were provided is accurate, I do not think it needs to change our recommendation regarding the proposed rate level. Uh, as contained in the individual report. And uh, just to clarify, um, you don't believe there'll be any change to your recommendation regarding the utilization trend, is that right? That is correct. Um, and do you have any changes to the small group report that you wish to make at this time? Only the exact thing I just described in relation to the individual report. Now, can you please explain your standard of review? Yes, we review the filings for uh, actuarial soundness. We review them to determine whether or not they are inadequate or excessive. We also review them for whether they are unfairly discriminatory. And do you review for affordability? No, we do not. Using your method, sorry, methodology and standard of review, did you make any recommendations to modify these proposed filings? Yes. If all of your recommendations were to be implemented, 
Can you explain what the ultimate projected rate increase for the individual filing would be? It would be 11.2% modified by whatever the difference is between um, the unit cost assumptions made at the time of the filing and those updated for the more recent hospital budget information. And if all of your recommendations were to be implemented, can you explain what the ultimate projected rate increase for the small group filing would be? 11.6% with the same caveat that is modified by whatever ultimately becomes the most accurate information available at the time of the order regarding hospital budget submissions. And do you find the 11.2% increase in the individual filing and the 11.6% increase in the small group filing reasonable? Again, with that important caveat, yes. That caveat being uh, the ultimate decision about hospital budgets? Yes, I'm sorry. Great. Um, and can you tell me why you find your uh, rate recommendations reasonable? Yes. Firstly, uh, we recommend that information which was not available at the time of the filing be considered by the board in updating the rates. Uh, I believe that the most reasonable way to set the rates is to use all information available at the time. Um, second, there were a few errors in the filing that I think are undisputed, uh, such as the unit cost issue. Our recommendation is that those be corrected. Um, lastly, our recommendation addresses what I perceive to be a inconsistency within Blue Cross's filing regarding the COVID adjustment and the utilization trend. Having made those changes, you believe the rates appear actuarially sound, adequate, non-excessive, non and not unfairly discriminatory? I do. And have you reviewed the other pre-filed testimony in this proceeding? I have. Have you listened to the testimony today so far? I have. Um, can you please discuss your recommendation about updating hospital budgets? Yes. Uh, a significant portion of the premium that we're discussing today will be paid to Vermont hospitals. The prices paid by Blue Cross to those hospitals uh, are yet to be determined. And between now and, well, between the time of the filing and when the board will make a decision regarding this filing, uh, new information has come to light and may continue to come to light. Uh, in order to ensure that the premiums are consistent with the benefits that they'll be covering, we recommend that the board consider any updated information available at that time. And having reviewed the pre-filed testimony and listened to the testimony today so far, do you wish to amend or add to Eleni's recommendation about updated hospital budget information? I do not. Can you please discuss your recommendation about correcting the unit cost trend calculation? Yes. Blue Cross uh, uses a spreadsheet and provides that spreadsheet uh, as part of their filing to determine what the aggregate impact of the rate changes by hospital is going to be on the premium. Uh, they found an error in that calculation during our review. Uh, we believe that errors of that sort should be corrected. Having reviewed the pre-filed testimony and listened to the testimony today so far, do you wish to amend or add to Eleni's recommendation about correcting the unit cost trend calculation? I do not. Uh, can you please discuss your recommendation about correcting the unified rate review template for the ARPA adjustment? Yes. Um, the unified rate review template, the URRT, is a reporting tool required by the ACA nationally. Um, carriers fill it out uh, basically to report in a standardized way um, how various factors relate their 2021 experience, in this case, to the proposed 2023 premiums. Uh, one of the items that carriers are requested to report in that exhibit is the impact of changes to the morbidity of the population, that is, changes to how sick the average person is. Blue Cross has made an adjustment to their experience because they believe that the American Rescue Plan Act is going to impact population morbidity 
We have opined that that adjustment was reasonable, but Blue Cross did not report it as part of the population morbidity changes in the URRT. So our recommendation is merely that the reporting tool be updated to more accurately reflect their pricing projections. Uh, that recommendation does not have any impact on the proposed premiums. So having reviewed the pre-filed testimony and listened to the testimony today so far, do you wish to amend or add to LNE's recommendation about correcting the URRT for the ARPA adjustment? I do not. Uh, can you please discuss your recommendation concerning updated risk adjustment transfers? Yes. Uh, in a manner somewhat similar to the, uh, the hospital budget issue, um, there's information that was not available at the time of the filing that is now available. In particular, that relates to the money that Blue Cross uh, is owed by MVP for the relative risk of the members that they enrolled during 2021. As such, uh, that is effectively part of their base period experience. And in general, it would not be reasonable to evaluate that base period experience only in part or only based on outdated information. So we have recommended that the payment, the accurate finalized payment from MVP to Blue Cross be recognized and incorporated into the rate development. So having reviewed the pre-filed testimony and listened to the testimony today so far, do you wish to amend or add to LNE's recommendation about risk adjustment transfers? I do not. And can you please discuss your recommendation concerning the update to the HDHP cost sharing? Yes. The rates that were initially filed in, in these filings uh, assumed benefits for high deductible health plans that ultimately will not be permissible for high deductible health plans. As such, the benefits have been changed. And in order for the rates to be actuarially sound, the premiums need to change in accordance with the benefits. So we have recommended that the premiums be updated to reflect those modified benefits. And having reviewed the pre-filed testimony and listened to the testimony today so far, do you wish to amend or add to LNE's recommendation regarding the HDHP cost sharing? I do not. Uh, can you please discuss your recommendation concerning the modification of the medical utilization trend? Yes. Uh, Blue Cross proposes their utilization trend for medical services um, across five service categories. Uh, we reviewed each of these and we believe that there are um, errors in the development of those as well as other methodological concerns and internal inconsistencies. As a result, we have recommended changes to the medical utilization factor. Uh, what errors do you reference in regard to the utilization trend? Most notably, um, the initial filing for the facility trend the professional facility trend. I apologize, the naming here is a bit confusing, but firstly, uh, facility, second, facility professional, and third, uh, the other professional. Those three categories were supported in the initial filing by regression analyses that uh, improperly did not consider the relationship of COVID-19 to the historical data. Um, what other flaws do you see in Blue Cross's proposed utilization trend? So, for the um, for the professional, for the other professional, uh, the Reasoning given in the filing for the proposed 1.0% utilization trend was that the data available was not sufficient in order to modify last year's assumption for the same item. Uh, however, the filing then proposes to modify it from 0.5% to 1.0. We consider this a flaw in the reasoning uh, and recommended that that be changed. Additionally, as I have noted, um, 
the trend calculations as supported today um, rely on the COVID adjustment. The COVID adjustment was calculated based on firstly the assumption that trend is zero percent and second the claim that total 2021 utilization was lower than total 2019 utilization when aggregated across all surface categories. Um, the support for the utilization trend uh, seems to disagree with this claim about 2021 utilization and additionally then uses that adjusted data to argue for a non-zero utilization trend. So methodologically speaking, I have concerns that there's some circularity and internal inconsistency in the filing when understood holistically. Could you please um, show us where in the record the uh, the claim about uh, 2021 utilization being lower than 2019 utilization can be found? I can, yes. Um, most clearly, I think, would be Exhibit 13, page 10. Oh, I'm sorry, I'll wait for you to get there. Thank you. Yep, I have it. Okay, so there is a lot on this page and I will revisit the earlier parts of, of this document that I think describe it in clearer detail. But notably, this is labeled total ACA experience by type of service. And it compares average contract year 2021 uh, utilization relative to a benchmark, which it defines as 2019 through February 2020. Uh, below the big box, you can see the word total, and next to it, it says minus 2.8%. Um, while it is possible, I have misinterpreted this exhibit. What we understood this exhibit to claim at the time of our report was that total utilization across all medical service categories was 2.8% lower than described as the pre-COVID benchmark, which is based almost entirely on 2019. I will acknowledge that technically it is not exclusively 2019. However, to explain the difference between this number and what is contained in Mr. Schultz's supplemental pre-file testimony, the 2020 January and February experience would have had to have been truly outstanding outliers such that they really should have been addressed explicitly. Now, that's not the only time that that claim has been made. Um, and I think this document uh, clarifies that our interpretation of this is at least approximately correct. Um, if we back up to exhibit 13, page two, uh, we can see the third paragraph, um, starting with the second sentence, while many months were impacted by a high level of deferred services, others were impacted in the opposite direction by returning care. The net impact was very close to zero for calendar year 2021. Now, that's referring to non-emergency services, and so I do believe that is consistent with the exhibit I just showed you, which just says minus 2.8%, but it is not consistent with attachment A as provided by Mr. Schultz, uh, at least to my understanding right now. We can then go further down on this same page. Um, we see uh, the final non-italicized paragraph the second line has a sentence beginning with rather. Rather, our, our conclusion, informed by an examination of actual experience data, is that the net impact of COVID generation, COVID generated deferred and returning care on the 2021 utilization of non-emergent services was not demonstrably different from zero. Now, again, I believe that's in reference to a number that's 0.8% in the exhibit I just showed you, um, which is negative. There's 
I believe a similar statement is made in the initial actuarial memorandum, but I, I think I think it is generally consistent with what I've described here. So I I think it's reasonable to move on. Great. So having reviewed the pre-file testimony and listened to the testimony today so far, do you wish do you wish to amend or add to Eleni's recommendation regarding the medical utilization trend? No, I do not. And after reading the carrier's pre-file testimony and all of the materials that have been submitted so far in the filing and then listening to today's testimony, is there anything you wish to add or change to the six recommendations we've covered so far? There is not. And if your recommendations as of today are implemented, do you believe the rates would be excessive? No. Do you believe they would be inadequate? No. And do you believe they would be unfairly discriminatory? I do not. Thank you. I have no further questions at this time. Mr. Battles, do you have questions for Mr. Ruggerberger? Yes, I do. I have a couple uh, questions. I'd also uh, ask uh, the board's permission to call uh, Mr. Schultz as a rebuttal witness to, to address some of the um, discussion that we just heard. But I would, uh, yeah, but I'll, I'll proceed first with that. Uh, with questions. Uh, good morning, Mr. Ruggerberg. Nice to meet you. Morning. It is still morning where I am. Good afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'd ask you to uh, turn to uh, Exhibit 17. Um, okay. And. Uh, and this is the uh, actuarial opinion that Lewis and Ellis prepared for Blue Cross's individual rate filing, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, and if you could turn to page 20. And uh, let me know when you're there. I'm not. Okay. And if you could read the first full paragraph on page 20 that uh, starts with the word so. So while we agree with Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont that the 0.1% reduction to claims is reasonable if the subsidies are extended, an increase to rates would be appropriate based on current law. Last year, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont estimated the favorable impact of the subsidy enhancement to be a 0.7% reduction to individual premiums. As an estimate, we assume that the termination of the enhanced ARPA subsidies would necessitate a 0.7% increase to the rates. Uh, thank you. Um, so did Blue Cross assume in its proposed rates that the ARPA subsidies would be extended and that this extension would reduce premiums in the individual market by 0.1 percent? Yes. Okay. Um, and is it correct that Lewis and Alice found that if uh, the ARPA subsidies are extended, that that estimate of a 0.1 percent reduction is reasonable? Yes. Um, and is it also correct that Lewis and Alice estimated that if the ARPA subsidies are not extended, that this would necessitate a 0.7 increase to premium rates? That is our estimate, yes. And do you agree that the, the difference between a 0.1% reduction and a 0.7% increase is 0.8%? I do. Okay. Is it therefore reasonable to assume that if the current law remains in place and the ARPA subsidies are not extended, that the cost to Blue Cross of providing coverage in, in the individual market will rise by 0.8%. I believe that is a reasonable estimate, yes. Um, and if that were to happen, do you agree that Blue Cross's effective contribution to reserves will be reduced from its file level by approximately 0.8%? I do. Thank you. Um, and I would ask you to uh, next turn to uh, exhibit 23 um, and specifically page uh, 14. Uh, 
Um, is this document uh, the University of Vermont Health Network's fiscal year 2023 hospital budget submission to the Green Mountain Care Board? I'm sorry, I'm not seeing page 14. It might have gotten lost somewhere. Um, um, is that Blue Cross's? So this is, I was referring you to uh, Mr. Schultz's supplementary pre-filed testimony, which attached the uh, UVM network submission. Uh, yes. Um, and so the, I'm sorry, it's a, uh, uh, so now we're looking at page 27 of exhibit 23. Give me just a moment to get there. I apologize. And I'm looking at the, the red page numbers on the bottom. Yeah, uh, yeah. Okay, exhibit 23, page 27. Yes. I'm there. Okay, um, and so this is uh, this is the VM Health Network recent budget submission. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, can you please find the paragraph uh, about halfway down the page, immediately preceding the bullet points, and read the sentence that begins, "We have chosen." We have chosen to focus on solutions that will make the best use of the talent, skill, and capabilities of our people to improve access to care while increasing revenue in fiscal year 2023. Thank you. And do you agree that increased revenue for facilities means increased claims costs for payers? Yes. Okay. Um, and uh, can you please read the next sentence on that page and the first sentence of the bullet point that follows? Some initiatives that will help ensure our sustainability include innovation in managing the use of acute care patient beds and post-acute beds and expansion of surgical capacity. Uh, did you say read the first sentence of each bullet? Uh, no, just the first one. So, thank you. And uh, so, if, if that initiative that, that uh, is described in that bullet you just read uh, is successful, um, do you agree that that would increase utilization and thereby increase future trend above recently observed levels? Yes, assuming that similar expansions weren't occurring during the period during which the trend is calculated. Understood. Um, and then if you could uh, turn to the, the next page uh, and read the third and final on that page, um, it's page 28. Addressing the backlog in delayed care by reducing the wait times caused by the pandemic and made worse by the workforce crisis. And same question, do you, do you agree if, if that initiative was successful that that could also increase utilization and thereby increase future trend above recently observed levels? Not if the recently observed levels already reflect a buildup of, you know, addressing the backlog of delayed care. So to the extent that 2021 is already elevated due to providing previously deferred care, it would not raise utilization above the observed level. But to the extent there is additional backlog that has not reflected in recent observed levels, then it would, correct? Well, to the extent that the backlog is being addressed faster than it was being addressed in 2021, yes. But the, exi the continued existence of a backlog would not mean that, no. I, I understand. Um, uh, Thank you, and uh, I have no further questions at that time, but I would ask uh, the board's permission to call Mr. Schultz in rebuttal after uh, Mr. Angoff has his and the board has their opportunity. Okay, Mr. Angoff, do you have questions for Mr. Ruggerberg? Yes, I do. Hi, Mr. Ruggerberg. You said that you uh, it's still morning where you are. Where are you? 
I am in beautiful Plano, Texas, just north of Dallas. So you're on central time. So right now it's good afternoon, Mr. Ruggerberg, right? It just became good afternoon, yes. All right, sorry. Um, so you, uh, you concluded based on your analysis that the rates that Blue Cross had proposed as amended by uh, Lewis and Ellis are not excessive, inadequate, or unfairly discriminatory, correct? Correct. Okay, you um, you, you didn't conclude that they were affordable, right? That's not that wasn't part of your job. No. And you didn't conclude that they promoted quality care. No. And you didn't conclude that they promoted access to health care. No. And you didn't conclude that they're not unjust, unfair, inequitable, or misleading, right? Uh, we do opine, I believe, that they're not unfairly discriminatory, which I think would definitionally overlap with that a little bit. Agree. With, with the exception that you did conclude that they're not unfairly discriminatory, you did not conclude that they're not unjust, not inequitable, and not misleading. Correct. And you certainly didn't conclude that they're not contrary to the laws of the state of Vermont. I don't believe we opined that. Now, if I was aware of them being contrary to the laws of Vermont, I believe I would have raised concerns about that. Okay, but you're not a lawyer. I'm not a lawyer, no. Okay. I, I certainly cannot opine that they are definitively in compliance with all of Vermont law. Very good. And when you concluded that the uh, rates proposed by Blue Cross as amended by L&E are not, un uh, not excessive, inadequate or unfairly discriminatory. You, you weren't saying, were you, that those are the only rates that were not, that could be not excessive, inadequate or unfairly discriminatory? You are correct. Okay, so uh, rates that were a little higher than the l &E recommendation could be not excessive, inadequate or unfairly discriminatory. Possibly, yes. Okay, and rates that were a little lower than what uh, l &E recommended would be not excessive, not inadequate, and not unfairly discriminatory, correct? Possibly, yes. Okay, so there's a range, isn't there, of rates that fit within that category of being not excessive, not inadequate, and not unfairly discriminatory, right? Yes. Okay, how do you determine what that range is? What, what's, what that range is? is so for the actuary developing the rates um, there's a long list of assumptions that need to be considered um, some of which are interrelated with each other and generally what the actuary should do is to consider what they think the uh, I won't say the most likely outcome. I, I'll say basically the middle of the range of reasonable rates is generally what should be done. Uh, I will say, you know, carriers can and sometimes do insert what they would call risk margins into their CTR assumption, which is effectively to build the rates off of an assumption which is slightly more conservative than their best estimates. Uh, when we evaluate the proposed premiums, we are evaluating whether we believe they fall within the range of reasonable. Okay, and and is there is there any formula that determines how wide that range is that you rely on? There is not. The actuarial guidance is uh, perhaps unfortunately thin in in that regard. Then, then how, how do you determine how broad the range is of rates that are within the zone of not being excessive, inadequate, or unfairly discriminatory? I would not say that there is any sort of clear algorithm for arriving at that point. Um, it is, that is most of what uh, is important in actuaries' professional discretion, which we develop, you know, as part of our working experience, and why we generally work in the industry for a while before opining on such things. Um, it is 
generally going to be a function of how uncertain the results are. And I will note that at this time, the level of claims in 2023 appears very uncertain. Um, so I don't think there is a particularly narrow range here because um, I don't think there is clear information about exactly what's going to happen on several things, right? ARPA, COVID, the utilization trend. Um, our determination that we did not believe the medical utilization trend fell within a reasonable range is that we did not see a internally consistent method producing the result that Blue Cross was proposing. So, so you're saying then that, that Blue Cross's uh, recommended proposed utilization trend was not even within the range of reasonableness. You're saying that's outside the range of reasonableness. Yes. Okay. And um, I know you talked about this before, and I apologize because I didn't get all of it, but I know you, you said their COVID adjustment, well, well, let me start this way. We, despite your best efforts and everyone else's best efforts, no one knows what the coronavirus situation is going to be in 2023, right? Okay, and so, but because of that, the range of reasonableness, well, well the uncertainty uh, with, with respect to this filing is even greater than the uncertainty uh, would be with respect to any other filing because of the uncertainty about COVID in 2023, right? I'm not comfortable saying any other filing. There are a whole lot of special circumstances out there. It is, no. I would say, more uncertain than the median filing. Very good. Okay, could you turn to uh, page one, please, of Exhibit 17? Yes. Okay, and that's your report, right? It is. Okay, and you see down there, the uh, there's a little chart of the uh, members by year that uh, Blue Cross has had in the small group and individual market. You see that? Yes. Okay. Did you do any analysis of the morbidity of the uh, the the, uh, the membership that was left after the rate increase of each year in that uh, in that table there? I don't have data on those members other than the summaries of the analysis Blue Cross provides uh, regarding that point. So I did not perform any analysis other than reviewing the materials provided in Blue Cross's filing. Okay. And do you have any opinion as to the morbidity of the, uh, the, the consistently decreasing membership in Blue Cross over the last five years? I apologize. The question over the last five years is very difficult to answer off the cuff. Um, is, there, is there a period of years during which you would, that question would be uh, less difficult to answer? As I recall today, um, I believe there was evidence as of the filings in roughly 2020 that suggested that possibly there were morbidity increases uh, going from 2017 to 2018. I am very hesitant to answer this question based on my limited memory of this, but as I sit here today, I believe that we noted at that time an increase in Blue Cross's risk score that would be consistent with healthy members having left. So, so by morbidity increase, does that mean that health status of the book of business is is worse than it was previously? Yes. Yeah. Could you turn, please, to page two of Exhibit 17? Okay. Okay, and you see there the metal levels have different uh, percentage change increases. You see there? Yes. Okay. And you see that the platinum uh, 
the, the increase for the platinum plan is 7.2%, substantially greater than all the increases for the other um, metal levels? Yes. Okay. Is that, could that result, could, could, could the fact that the increase for the platinum, the most uh, generous plan, uh, the fact that that increase is, is so much greater than the others, could that uh, produce a death spiral? That is, could that result in just consistently less and less healthy people being in the platinum plan because the more healthy people even out of the group of less healthy people would not find that it makes any economic sense anymore. It could. Uh, however, I'll note that the, okay, so I, two caveats to that response. Um, firstly, the ACA requires that all of the metal tiers be rated as a single risk pool. So, the platinum plan really can't experience a death spiral without the entire block experiencing a death spiral because it's not rated separately from the other metal tiers. Second, I'll note that while I don't have numbers in front of me, my general understanding is that members who are purchasing platinum plans are, as a cohort, extremely sick, such that most of them, it would be uh, it would be against their best interests to shift down to a lower metal tier. So as a practical matter, are you saying that, is it fair to say then that Blue Cross can, can really raise the rate to these people by a substantial amount without a material uh, number of them leaving? I think that's possible. Uh, I don't have uh, data on exactly what the distribution of those members' morbidity looks like. I I am being more speculative than I ought to be, I think, in this response, and I want to make that clear. You have made it clear. Okay, could you turn, please, to page six? Okay. Okay, and down close to the middle of the page, you see the heading medical unit cost trend. Yes. Okay. And under there, you say to project medical unit costs forward from 2021 to 2022, actual negotiated provider payment changes were used. Can you explain to me what you mean by actual negotiated provider payment changes? Yes. Um, most of the assumptions we discuss in this filing are as yet undetermined. Right? We don't actually know what their value will ultimately be. However, um, in regards to the prices paid by Blue Cross to hospitals during 2020, that is a settled issue. Uh, at least, it, I, I suppose the mid-year increases complicate that slightly, but exempting that uh, caveat, Going into 2022, and therefore at the time of this filing, Blue Cross knows the rates being paid in 2022 to their network hospitals. So there's not assumptions necessary in setting that. So those are hard numbers. Correct. That we're looking at. Correct. Okay. Um, and unlike in most cases, the, the, the numbers that you look at and evaluate the reasonableness of are estimates. Okay, um, I, I might have been thrown by the negotiated uh, word. You are, you, you didn't examine, did you, whether in fact Blue Cross negotiated with the providers uh, on the rates that were, that, that, that you incorporated your, in your analysis? Did you? I am not privy to the nature of those negotiations. Fine. Um, okay, could you turn to page eight, please? And I I'm not gonna continue to beat a dead horse on this. I just wanna, wanna understand it a little bit better. The, You told Mr. or you told Ms. Bellavo 
that the COVID adjustment that Blue Cross used may not be reasonable, correct? Okay, could you explain that as, as simply as you can to a non-actuary? Yes, I can. Um, my understanding of these two aspects of uh, Blue Cross's rate submission, which are two of many, but for simplicity's sake, let's focus on these two. We have the COVID adjustment and the utilization trend. Um, each of those involves assumptions and looking at the data and then drawing conclusions. Um, because the COVID adjustment is used in arguing for the utilization trend, I think it's reasonable to present it sort of chronologically as first and then progress through the utilization trend. So I would like to, at a high level, describe the logic of those two adjustments all at once and describe why I don't think it's consistent. Blue Cross uh, asserts, uh, I believe, that total 2021 utilization is lower across all medical services than total 2019 utilization. They attribute this primarily to emergency services and say that all of the other services appear to have been in line with 2019. That is to say, 2021 is lower than 2019. They then say, assuming that medical utilization trend is zero, that would imply that COVID suppressed 2021 utilization. Now, given those two assumptions, that's very reasonable. However, Blue Cross then takes that COVID adjustment that they calculate using that strain of logic and applies it to the 2021 utilization. And then as is presented in Mr. Schultz's supplemental pre-filed testimony, which is exhibit 23 on page 12, Mr. Schultz states that total medical utilization was about three and a half percent higher in 2021 than in 2019. And then on this basis, asserts that medical trend is not zero, is actually about 2% per year. So within this fairly straightforward thread of logic, uh, there appear to be two inconsistencies. First, the assumption that medical trend is zero, which then informs the assumption that medical trend is not zero. And more importantly, the claim the 2021 utilization is below 2019, and then subsequently the claim that 2021 utilization is above 2019. So by my read of all of that, something has to be at least misleadingly misrepresented, um, or I have to be sorely mistaken about what is contained in this filing. Thank you. I understand that. Then in your opinion, what is the reasonable range of utilization trend? I am hesitant to opine on the entirety of that range, given the outstanding questions I have on precisely what it is that the data says. Okay. Well, but would a 1% trend be reasonable? 1% for what value? The total medical utilization? Yes. Based on the information in front of me, I believe a 1% would probably be reasonable. Would a half a percent trend be reasonable? Probably not. Um, there are components of the medical utilization that appear to be unequivocally increasing. Um, that's mostly the mental health and the medical prescription stuff. Um, both of those are increasing at substantial levels for reasons that are clear, independent of the data. Um, I do not believe it would be reasonable to assume zero for those. And I believe if you were to leave those unchanged, it would produce something between a half a percent and one percent. So somewhere in that range is where I'm going to get very uncomfortable calling something reasonable. Some something where something within what range you would find the range of a half a percent to one percent between a half a percent and one percent you would what would be I think based on the information I have now the line where I would say an assumption would be unreasonably low okay 
but and and we're talking now about trend for the uh, overall utilization trend. Yes. Okay. And one percent would be reasonable, though. Based on the information I have now, I have pointed out I have questions about the data that I have now, and I would prefer not to opine on numbers very clearly without resolving those concerns. But you, but you are you are you have opined that Blue Cross's selection is unreasonable, correct? Correct. And that selection was what? Uh, about two percent. Um, so what, uh, go to the bottom of page 10, please. Uh, and in the last paragraph. I'm sorry, page 10 of what? It's, it's of exhibit 17. And that paragraph talks just about the facility trend, right? Correct. Okay. And so. For the, the, the facility trend, you are recommending be reduced to 1%, right? Correct. Okay. And would it be reasonable? Is there some, some zone, some range below that 1% that would also be reasonable? Yes. And do you have a, a feel for what that range would be? Again, I would prefer not to answer that question without uh, hearing from Mr. Schultz's rebuttal regarding uh, exactly why the filing materials appear to be inconsistent. Uh, I am cognizant of my actuarial standards of practice that suggest I should not rely on data that I have these sorts of concerns about. And in this case, you have concerns of about the data that you have relied on, is that right? Yes, and that is basically because using the logic that Blue Cross presented regarding the COVID adjustment, um, which is to say that they assumed there was zero trend and then attributed any changes to COVID, um, using that logic and attachment A, as provided by Mr. Schultz, would suggest that there should have possibly been a COVID adjustment in the opposite direction. Um, I'm not comfortable opining that that is appropriate because um, there's a lot of contingencies to that. But given that, it is very difficult for me today to assess the utilization data provided. G given that it's difficult for you today to assess the... Uh... It is difficult to assess the utilization data that Blue Cross has provided. Okay, and based on that difficulty, you've concluded what? At the moment that I would not like to opine on utilization trend numbers other than what we put in our report. Okay. Um, there uh, again, there's no there's no formula that you follow that allows you to evaluate whether uh, whether an assumption is reasonable or not, right? There is not. It's just your judgment. Correct. My judgment guided by the actuarial standards of practice and my education and work experience. Um, could you turn, please, to page 11 of Exhibit 17? Yes. Okay. And th there, there's, there are numbers having to do with mental health utilization. Um, and you see there on the right, the one-year trends are declining, correct? Correct. Okay. So why would it not be... Uh, actuarially justified to conclude that mental health uh, trend is declining. I do not believe it would be appropriate for me to state that the assumption should be reduced because I do not believe there is clear evidence that it will continue moving downward in the short term. Uh, I do not believe we opined that a lower number would be unreasonable. Say that again. I do not believe we opined that a lower number would be unreasonable. Okay. How did you conclude that uh, Blue Cross's use of an 8.5% mental health utilization trend 
is reasonable. Um, because it is in line with the most recent three years of increases. But those increases, and, sorry, go ahead. And because of the supplementary information that Blue Cross provided describing efforts to expand access and things of that sort. Uh, but you agree, don't you, that mental health, uh, mental health usage uh, increased during the pandemic, correct? Absolutely. And so would it, if you assume that uh, the COVID, that, that uh, the pandemic is, is going to go away at some time and then it's, it's, uh, it's effects are being reduced today, wouldn't you expect that mental health usage would also decline? No, not necessarily. Um, as is noted on this page, um, mental health was already increasing rapidly prior to COVID. Um, while there is a good chance that some of the increases that have been observed during COVID are actually results of COVID, um, I do not think it is necessarily appropriate to assume that utilization would return all the way to pre-COVID levels. Um, there are other trends at play, including, you know, removal of social stigmas around seeking, seeking treatment and expansion of the provider base and things like that, such that I do not think all of the observed increases are the result of COVID. Sure, but there's a big difference, isn't there, between, uh, on the one hand, mental health usage returning to pre-COVID days, and on the other hand, it going up 8.5% a year. That is true. Um, however, it is, I think, entirely reasonable to think that mental health utilization will increase by the 8.5% or perhaps more in line with, say, the 11.2 or the 9.8 that has happened recently. I don't think it is particularly appropriate to assume that it would be zero change moving forward, and certainly don't think there's any reason to believe it's actually going to decrease. So I don't think a best estimate would be anywhere near assuming that it stops increasing. Sure, but but I'm not suggesting that it, that it stop increasing. I'm just, uh, I guess I'm just asking you, isn't it reasonable that the increase could be less than 8.5%? It, it absolutely could be less than 8.5%. Okay, could you turn please to page 14 of uh, your report? Yes. Okay, and so I'm just looking at those two summary tables and you agree with me, don't you, that uh, for inpatient, uh, inpatient, Blue Cross says 1.5, you say one, for outpatient, Blue Cross says 1.5, you say 1. For facility professional, Blue Cross says 1.5, you say 1. For other professional, Blue Cross says 1, you say 0 0.5, right? Okay. My only question is, with all those differences, I would think that the difference in the total would be more than the four-tenths of 1% between 2.0 and 1.6%. Can you tell me why the total is only the difference between 2.0 and 1.6? We have made recommendations that we believe move Blue Cross's assumption into the range of reasonableness. Um, that does not necessarily mean that the concerns we raise would not produce a best estimate, which is lower than the 1.6. Could you turn please, please to page 16? Okay. Okay, and there we're talking about 
uh, utilization trend for non-specialty drugs. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the second paragraph. You see that? Yes. Okay, and so are you saying that based on the 1.4, the 3.2, and the 1.3, uh, a 2% two, a two uh, trend is reasonable? Yes. Okay, and how did you figure that out? Uh, it's fairly consistent with the most recent three years of trend, which is a methodology that Blue Cross has uh, used and said they consider reasonable uh, fairly consistently during my time reviewing their filings. Okay, but, but, but you didn't add those three together and then divide by three, right? You just just looked at it, correct? You didn't just, you didn't add those three together and divide by three. Um, I very well might have done that. I, I, what back of the envelope calculations I did when reviewing this item, I can't say for sure. Okay, but but in in opining that a, that a, an assumption, uh, a, an assumption here is that Blue Cross made is reasonable and appropriate. You. Can you explain to me the process that you went through? Yes, we reviewed the data that Blue Cross provided as well as all of the narrative information they provided in addition to it. Um, we believed that all of the information provided in totality uh, supported the 2.0% utilization trend as a reasonable selection. Okay, and what a, what a trend of less than 2.0%. 0% be reasonable. I, I have to say I haven't reviewed all of the relevant uh, information regarding this exact assumption in a bit. I, I'm not really prepared to opine on that right this moment. Okay, but in opining that the 2.0% was reasonable, you weren't saying, were you, that that was the lowest reasonable assumption, were you? No, we were not. Um, could you go down to the fourth paragraph on page eight, page 16? Yes. Okay, and, and there Blue Cross selected a 10% trend based on the three numbers of 7.1, 7.0, and 10.1. Do you see that? I do. Okay, and you opined that that trend uh, is reasonable, correct? We did, yes. Okay, but looking at those three numbers, it, it, it's certainly the case, isn't it, that a trend less than 10 point, that somewhat less than 10.0% also would be reasonable, correct? No, I, I disagree. Um, utilization trend and unit cost trend are two very different concepts. Um, unit cost trend is impacted by uh, general inflation, because it is itself basically a component of inflation. We know that inflation across industries, across sectors, across products is elevated right now over what it was during the period that this data describes. So I do not think it is reasonable to assert that all reasonable assumptions would necessarily lie in the range of what was recently observed. I'm asking you, I'm not asking you to so assert. I'm only asking you whether it would be reasonable based on those three numbers to uh, select a trend estimate of somewhat less than 10.0%. I am not sure it would be appropriate to set that assumption based on those three numbers alone. So the question, would it be reasonable to set the assumption at a particular level based on these three numbers, is that reasonable? I think the answer is no, because more than just those three numbers matter for the setting of this assumption. Okay, but you're not opining that the 10.0% is the lowest reasonable trend that could be selected, correct? We are not. Okay, um, could you please turn to page 17? I'm there. Based on the... Uh, Based on those numbers, what's 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 the reasonable trend range? 
based on the numbers in the table it, at the it, top? Yeah, in the, in the, the top the top box showing the four the four year to years. I don't think that box alone can answer that question. Okay. And what else do you need to answer that question? There is more detailed information provided by Blue Cross um, in the filing regarded, regarding you know, monthly numbers, the breakdown by brand, generic, specialty, all of those things. There is general knowledge about the change in the inflation environment. Um, there is, you know, Blue Cross provided several pages of description of how they arrived at that assumption and we reviewed all of it. We did not review just those numbers. And it would not be reasonable to review just those numbers and opine on the assumption. Uh, could you turn, page, turn please to page 23? I'm there. Okay. In the, uh, there's the bullet and then one, two, three. Uh, the third paragraph, you found that Blue Cross admin costs ranked 10th out of 62 plans assessed. You see that? I do. Okay. And that's, that, that's 10th highest, right? Not 10th lowest. Correct. Okay. But then in the next paragraph, you say that Blue Cross used to be on the low end of administrative costs. Correct. Okay. Did you do any analysis to determine how Blue Cross came from being on the low end of administrative costs to on the high end of administrative costs? Um, Blue Cross's actual administrative costs, PMPM, have increased substantially in recent years. Um, that is based on statements by Blue Cross that I have not audited, but I understand it to be true, and I don't find it surprising given the loss of enrollment that they've experienced. So, and you may have heard this discussion before, then you agree that as as enroll, as Blue Cross has lost business over the years, administrative costs per member per month have gone up, right? Generally, that has happened, yes. But if Blue Cross now, let's let's assume Blue Cross has bottomed out and it's going to start gaining a little business, you would expect administrative costs to go down, right? Yes. Okay. Could you turn to page 24? And in the first paragraph there, you say you analyzed 442 carriers to see what their CTRs were, you see that? Yes. By the way, is there any other state that calls what is called a Vermont CTR, that call, that call, that use that terminology? Uh, I certainly can't answer that for all states. Off the top of my head, I'm not sure uh, that I can think of any. Right. What do they usually call it? Contribution to surplus, right? Or profit margin or risk margin, profit and risk margin sometimes. Okay, but it's, it's, it's the same thing. Correct. Okay. Um, among those 442, 442 carriers, those included both nonprofits and for profits, right? Correct. Okay. Did you do any analysis to determine where Blue Cross's CTR ranked among the, for -pro the nonprofit carriers? No. Okay. Uh, in the second to last paragraph on that page, the last sentence, 
You say L&E believes a reasonable range for the base CTR is 0.7% to 3.7%. You see that? Yes. Okay, how did you come to determine that? As we note in that paragraph, um, I, I think it's in that paragraph, um, Blue Cross reduces the CTR that's actually in the rates by about 0.7%. Um, to basically not build in the cost of COVID treatment into the rates. As such, the base CTR is 0.7% higher than what effectively the CTR is in the premiums. Um, so this sentence can be read to say that we think a reasonable range for the final CTR would be from 0% to 3%. Now, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Um, I, I will note that a 0% CTR is not something to be taken lightly. And um, while if Blue Cross had submitted that 0.7% um, as what they wanted to be in their rates if they made that business decision, I would have found it reasonable. Um, I very much would not have been comfortable recommending that it be reduced to that level, given what I know about Blue Cross's uh, financial situation. Explain to me the... I understood what you said, but why would your why would your decision as to whether or not it's reasonable depend on what uh, what, what Blue Cross felt? So there's ultimately um, Blue Cross is responsible for ensuring that. They can maintain adequate capital to meet their obligations. Um, they understand the particulars of exactly what they need to make that happen in more detail than I do. Um, particularly on issues like this, I don't think it is appropriate um, to view my range of reasonable with the same consideration as Blue Cross's actuary's range of reasonable. Uh, for instance, carriers somewhat often file negative CTRs or negative profit margins or however you want to label it. Um, it can be reasonable for them to make the business decision that they wish to lose money. And if they have determined that that is a sound financial decision, I as a reviewer might well call it reasonable. However, I, as a reviewer, have difficulty imagining a scenario where I would recommend a substantially negative CTR in a filing. I understand the difference. When you say uh, make a decision to lose money, you're, what you mean, don't you, is uh, make a decision to lose money on their, uh, on their ACA business, not to lose money on their overall business. I'm, if you lose money per unit, it is difficult for that to result in making money. <laughs> right, I mean, there's the old joke, yeah, we lost, the, we, we lost money, but we made it up in volume. I mean, right, I, 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 right. <laughs> I, I wanna be clear that I do not think in general, rates which produce losses on the margin uh, can make up for those losses in volume. Right. So a company, it's, it's not realistic to think that a company makes the decision to lose money on its entire business, correct? Um, in the short term, it happens with some regularity, actually. Um, growing carriers often submit across all of their blocks negative margins. Fair enough. So there's a difference between losing money in the short term and losing money in the long term. 
But would you agree with me that it makes more sense for a carrier in the short term to decide to lose money on its small group and individual ACA business rather than on all its business? That's really a business decision more than an actuarial one. So I, I'm not sure exactly what value I can provide in response to that question. Okay, is it fair to say that, that, that then you are relying on Blue Cross's representations as to, uh, as, its, as to its financial status and its RBC ratio? You haven't yourself uh, evaluated the reasonableness of Blue Cross's representations, correct? I have evaluated it based on those representations. You've evaluated what based on its representation? I have evaluated the CTR based on those representations. Very good. Thank you very much, Mr. Ruggerberg. Appreciate your patience. That's all I have. Thank you. You're Thanks muted, Mike. Muted. All right, I said, let's move to board questions. Um, I, I just want to note that we are not as far along as I was hoping we would be at this point in the day. So if we could keep it uh, concise, uh, that would be much appreciated. So I'll start with board member Lund. She have questions for Mr. Ruggerberg. I do not. Board member Holmes. I do not. Board member Pelham. I do not. Board member Walsh. No questions. Mr. Chair. Nor do I. Okay. So I, I will. I actually do have one question for you, Mr. Ruggerberg. Um, uh, there was one thing I wanted to clarify, and then I will turn it over to Laura for any redirect, and then I do think, uh, well, Mr. Battles, you, would you like a opportunity to ask additional questions? I understand that Mr. Angoff's questioning went uh, a bit beyond what um, Ms. Bellavo had brought out. No, I don't think uh, like to do that at this point, but it would, uh, like the opportunity for, for a short recess and then the opportunity to call uh, Mr. Schultz back for rebuttal. Uh, Mr. Ruggerberg, I did just have one question. Could you please turn to exhibit 30? This was one of the late filed exhibits. Okay. Uh, so there's um, a table for each market uh, with Columns for originally filed l &E recommendation and Blue Cross proposed. Do you see that? Yes. And do you see uh, the blue text for um, medical cost trend from 21 to 23? Yes. What is your understanding of uh, what those numbers assume with respect to hospital budgets? don't think I have access to precise information there. Um, so based on exhibit 29, Blue Cross indicated that for both blocks, um, the impact of the hospital budgets if they were approved as filed would be about two point sorry uh three point five or three point six percent relative to the initial filing um so what i can say is that the two point five percent increase here uh appears to be or I'm, I'm sorry it's actually it's 2.8, isn't it? Um, it? What Blue Cross has filed in Exhibit 30 assumes 
that the board will substantially approve something much higher than it has in past years, but not quite as high as what has been requested by the hospitals. Has Blue Cross provided any analysis to your knowledge supporting their assumptions here? I'm just trying to figure out if if there's something that you're analyzing with respect to hospital budget submissions or if you, if there's additional questions that you may need to ask them about that. I'm not actually, I don't believe I have support for this 49% on individual and 15.4% on small group. Um, so I, I might have missed it in the late flurry of documents there at the end, but I, I don't believe I have that. That's all I had. Ms. Bellavo, do you have any redirect for Mr. Ruggerberg? I do not. Okay. So I think that is, uh, you can be excused, Mr. Ruggerberg, and now we'll move on to, I believe you wanted to call Paul Schultz back to the stand, Mr. Bells. Thank you. Sorry, I just took a second to uh, unmute myself. If I could have a, uh, a five minute recess before doing that, I'd be grateful for that. Okay, I forgot. Thank you. So um, we will take a five minute recess and reconvene at two o'clock. Thank you. Mr. Battles, are you ready to proceed? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Barber. I would like to recall Mr. Schultz to testify to the virtual stand. Hello. Uh, hello again, Mr. Schultz. Hello again, Mr. Uh, were you able to listen and just now to Mr. Rugberg's testimony? I was. Uh, and did you hear his testimony specifically regarding uh, Lewis and Alice's disagreement with Blue Cross's assumptions regarding medical utilization trend? I did. And do you agree with his opinion that Blue Cross's assumptions were internally inconsistent or that uh, its methods were, were flawed in its analysis? Uh, no, I don't. So I, I just want to clarify a few points for the record. Um, I'm first looking at ex binder exhibit 13, page 10, which Mr. Ruggeberg referred to um, at some length. And, and I do want to clarify that our COVID adjustment was made only for those services that by their nature cannot be deferred, specifically emergency room, urgent care, ambulance, flu, pneumonia. Um, we did not make an adjustment for other services. Um, and I just want to make sure that point is clear on the record. Um, also, I note that Mr. Ruggerberg referred to, I believe, three different exhibits um, and stated that the exhibits were internally inconsistent. And I, I want to clarify that, that they are not inconsistent. They, in fact, um, describe three different measures. So starting again on exhibit 13, page 10, uh, this exhibit shows the number of services by category for the entire ACA population. This is not an overall PMPM. This is purely focused on number of services, and that's the analysis that we did um, to support our COVID adjustment, or more to the point, our lack thereof, for services other than those that simply cannot be deferred because of their nature. Um, Mr. Ruggeberg contrasted that with Exhibit 23, page 12, that shows a positive trend from 2019 to 2021. And I, I'd like to clarify that this exhibit is not number of services and it's not for the full population. This is for the matched population only. And I, I don't think we've gotten into that terminology. Um, but yeah, I was going to ask if you could just briefly describe what, what you mean by that. I, I can. So um, noting that in the past, um, uh, some of the trend analysis that we had done may have been influenced 
by population shifts over time, uh, we uh, landed upon a new methodology that uses what we refer to as a matched population. And uh, in the interest of time, I won't get into the details of exactly how that works, but the uh, end impact of using that matched population is that it, it completely normalizes for any sort of shifts in the population. l and &E is a pound on that, and they found that that's an effective methodology uh, that's an improvement on the way we used to uh, do our trend analysis. So um, uh, the clarification I wish, wished to make is that this exhibit is on the matched population and it is on the full PMPM rather than just the utilization. Um, and finally, I'd, I'd like to make the observation that Lewis and Ellis has recommended that a 1.54% 1, 1 trend is a fair characterization of past or underlying uh, medical trend. That's the recommendation in their report. And I will observe that the 1.54% is not what I would call significantly different from the actual two-year trend of 1.77%. So if I were to use this page to calculate our COVID adjustment, I would have reached the same conclusion that I did for the filing that we cannot discern that COVID had a significant or material impact in an upward or a downward direction uh, on actual results. I'm saying that because uh, we, that when what we actually looked at, we saw a 0.8% decrease across all services and concluded that that was not sufficiently material to merit an upward adjustment to rates. So similarly, I can look at the difference between the 1.77% and the 1.54%, which is 0.23%, and conclude that neither is that sufficient evidence to merit a downward adjustment of about a quarter of a point for COVID. So either way, um, I consistently arrive at the same conclusion that apart from services that cannot by their nature be deferred, COVID had no discernible impact on 2021 experience. And further, based on the information in attachment A and information we've provided elsewhere in my testimony and in all of the uh, exhibits and the material that went back and forth, I, I uh, still arrive at the same conclusion that future uh, facility trend in particular is likely to be higher than recent past facility trend and that an overall medical trend of 2% uh, is indeed reasonable. Thank you, Mr. Schultz. And I would like to also draw your attention to a point that uh, Mr. Barber asked about and uh, specifically discussing uh, Exhibit 30 and Blue Cross's final proposed rates. Uh, and I would uh, just ask you to briefly explain how you arrived at those numbers. Um, sure. So uh, as I believe I, I went into a little bit of detail earlier today, we started with the hospital budget submissions. We assumed that the Green Mountain Care Board would decrease those uh, submissions by 1% across the board. Uh, and that 1% is aligned with uh, the Green Mountain Care Board action in recent hospital budget cycles. And the final numbers also include some updated uh, final contract information that's become finalized since the time of initial filing. Um, so that uh, hopefully explains why the numbers on Exhibit 30 can be seen to be different from the numbers uh, that were on Exhibit 29. And I'll clarify, we have not provided support for those numbers to Mr. Ruggerberg just yet. Typically that support is provided after hearing. This is kind of a just-in-time exercise to assimilate all the hospital budget information that only just late last week was fully posted to the board's website. Um, so we, you know, we were able to prepare the exhibit, but we have not yet provided the support to Mr. Ruggerberg, and we look forward to doing so uh, after the hearing. Uh, thank you. Is, is there anything else you'd like to add uh, in response to the testimony that you just heard? No, nothing further. No further questions. Mr. Angoff, do you have any thoughts on those issues? I think this has been sufficiently beaten to death. I have no questions. Stelvo? I have no questions. And board members? Thank you. Just if any board member does have a question to speak up. Okay. 
Thank you, Mr. Schultz. If you could please stick around for an executive session uh, later this afternoon, please. Of course. And Ms. Bellavo, um, did you want to take a minute to confer with Eleni about whether any uh, additional quest questions for Mr. Ruggerberg are needed or should we move ahead with uh, Ms. Green? Uh, we're all set and uh, please feel free to move ahead. So Mr. Battles, are you ready to call Ms. Green to the stand? Uh, yes, I am. Thank you. And uh, cross calls Ruth Green. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Ms. Green. Could you please raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear that the evidence you shall give relative to the cause under consideration shall be the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Go ahead, Mr. Okay. Good afternoon, Ms. Green. Can you please state could you please state your full name for the record? My name's Ruth Green. And uh, what is your position with Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Vermont? I hold the position of treasurer and CFO. And did you prepare and submit pre-filed testimony in this proceeding? I did. Can you identify uh, where that pre-filed testimony is in the exhibit binder? Yes, the my pre-filed testimony is in uh, exhibit 22. Thank you. Uh, was all the testimony contained in Exhibit 22 true and correct to the best of your knowledge at the time you filed it? It is. As you sit here today, is all that testimony uh, still true and correct to the best of your knowledge? Yes, it is, although I would like to update my testimony for um, with regard to how Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont's administrative costs compared to other insurers. Certainly, and, and uh, why do you need to update your testimony on that subject? At the time I filed my pre-filed testimony, um, or shortly thereafter, the l &E report came out, which had updated information with regard to the um, how Blue Cross's administrative costs compared to other insurers. Uh, and are you referring to the uh, exhibits 17 and 18, which we've uh, discussed throughout the day today? Yes, I am. 17 and 18. Yes. Okay. Uh, would you please turn to exhibit 17 in the binder? Yep, I'm there. And is this uh, LNE's actuarial opinion on the uh, individual filing? Yes, it is. Okay. Um, and if you would please turn to page 23. Uh, and uh, please describe the updated information that you mentioned a moment ago. Yes, on page 23, the, the top half of that page, um, as we have already covered a couple of statistics on this page, uh, LNE was able to pull together an updated uh, comparison of our costs to other nationwide Blue Cross plans. And uh, as we noted already in previous testimony, um, the administrative costs rank 10th out of 62 plans for on a PM PM basis, um, and that on a percentage of premium basis, uh, Blue Cross ranks 31st out of 62 plans, which um, means that on a percentage basis, Blue Cross had lower expenses than half of the other um, Blue plans who sold individual and small group business. And um, as, as Kevin Rutherford mentioned earlier, um, they did note in their report on page 23 that uh, we, pre we were previously on the low end of the administrative costs for blue plans nationally, um, but uh, as a small uh, state and uh, a small membership base, uh, we have to spread our fixed costs over more 
cover more than um, what other blue plans cover. And we did have a shift in 2021 of membership um, out of uh, one set of our platforms to a different partnership platform, which does have the effect of increasing the ACA um, PMPM basis. Um, Eleni also uh, reported that they didn't think that um, having administrative costs at the 85th percentile was unusual given given our size and the number of segments that we um, cover and they did conclude that our expense assumptions were reasonable and appropriate. Um, and is this same analysis also in the l &E opinion for the small group filing which is at exhibit 18? Yes it is. Um, in your opinion are Blue Cross's administrative expenses reasonable? Yes, in my opinion, uh, the administrative costs, especially as that relates to the small group and individual plans are reasonable. In total, Blue Cross uh, has to have staffing and technology to serve all of the segments that we um, provide coverage for in Vermont, and that requires a certain amount of fixed overhead and, and support for all of those segments. Um, and we also meaningfully participate in a lot of the healthcare reform initiatives and um, provide for some of the innovate, innovative programs that Paul had described earlier today. Um, I won't go through all of those, um, but I, I would like to note also that the um, um, going forward in 2023, our rates also uh, include a couple of new services that Paul mentioned earlier, the credit card flexibility um, payment options for members, as well as the Vermont Health Connect billing. And with all of that, our administrative costs as a percent of premium went down in 2023. What percentage of the as filed individual and small group premium reflects administrative costs? On a combined basis, the as filed, it was 7.3% of premium, which basically means, as Paul testified earlier, uh, that a, a small portion of premium, just over seven cents, goes towards uh, the administrative cost to administer the insurance. Uh, if you could turn to your pre filed testimony, uh, which is Exhibit 22. Um, And do you um, and do you explain within there your uh, decision to direct Mr. Schultz to include a nominal 1.5 percent contribution to reserves in the filed rates? Sure, as I uh, included in my pre-filed testimony and uh, it was part of the rate submission, I instructed Mr. Schultz to file a, a 1.5. A CTR in a mem memorandum that um, is dated May 2nd, 2022. And um, that memorandum, we've um, taken to submitting that with our rate filing each year to outline our philosophy and setting CTR, and our philosophy hasn't changed. Um, we do take a long term view. Um, we know that there's been a lot of volatility in the business world and the healthcare world over the last several years. And our um, reserves and surplus has uh, oscillated up and down, but uh, we remain committed to having a long term assumption for CTR of one and a half percent so that uh, we can uh, limit the amount of volatility that might be felt within premium rates. Thank you. And so we, we've talked a little bit already today about the term uh, RBC or risk based capital. And I would just, if you could just briefly explain what that means and how it uh, is different uh, from CTR. Okay. Uh, risk, risk based capital is um, a measurement of a point in time of an insurance solvency. It compares the level of um, reserves to the amount of risk that an insurance company has uh, for the coverage that it's written. And so the RBC looks across all of the businesses of Blue Cross and um, it's a snapshot of um, the solvency. Whereas a CTR, a contribution to reserve, which we use specifically because we are a nonprofit, uh, we don't think of it as 
a profit margin because it's the minimum necessary to sustain that RBC over time. So the CTR is really just a component within each rate um, development that we do that ensures that each of our segments is contributing towards that um, long-term goal. Um. And I know Mr. Uh, Ruggerberg testified a little bit about this already, but uh, you know, did uh, did he uh, and Lewis and Alice review the reasonableness of the 1.5% CTR? They did. If I go back to Exhibit 17, um, I believe it's page 24. Exhibit 17, page 24. Um, they did have a look at the. Uh, contribution to reserve or the risk margin that uh, insurers include. And they did say that our one and a half percent would place Blue Cross at around the 27th percentile for all QHP carriers. Um, we did talk earlier about um, in the 442 filings that they looked at that the uh, CTR that uh, showed up most frequently was zero to five percent. And uh, further down below in um, one, two, third paragraph underneath the table on page 24, they talk about uh, LNE does not recommend a change from the base CTR of one and a half percent. And they did in indicate that um, in the following paragraph that a base CTR of three percent would be in line with typical individual and small group filings nationally. Uh do you agree that a, that a CTR of 3% of here would uh, be reasonable? I can imagine a, a scenario where a 3% CTR would be reasonable, yes. And why is that? I can think of two reasons. The primary reason is, is something that we outline every year in our philosophy on CTR, and that is if there's a reasonable um, probability or, or reasonable likelihood that our contribution or our RBC would would be um, tracking to be above the top end of our target range. Um, I'm sorry, the other way around. If it, if the trajectory is tracking such that the there's a um, high probability of it falling below um, the target range, we would have to start considering increasing CTR. And um, the second reason really is because uh, since we made this filing and since I provided that report to Paul, uh, Mr. Schultz, the, um, the hospital budget request, the price increases that the hospitals are requesting have come in since the time of our filing. And uh, one of the things that drives what we call the minimum necessary CTR, which has been a long term assumption of one and a half percent, is that uh, the, the medical trend um, as that goes up every year, um, the one and a half percent sort of is designed to sustain RBC. If that medical trend were to accelerate and um, continue at a much higher rate, uh, we would have to increase CTR above one and a half percent, say to three percent or or something, um, you know, certainly above one and a half. And. Uh so, in your opinion, uh, would it be uh, would it make sense to decrease the nominal CTR below 1.5 percent? No, under current circumstances, it would be imprudent to decrease CTR below the base CTR below one and a half percent. Given your instruction to Mr. Schultz to file a 1.5 percent nominal CTR and not include COVID-related claims in 2023 rates. What is your expected outcome for the individual and small group markets with respect to CTR? Yeah, that was covered uh, at length in, in uh, Mr. Ruggerberg's um, uh, testimony, but uh, just to uh, state it here, we estimate that there will be further direct COVID claims in 2023, and we have for um, since the pandemic began, we have viewed our reserves as the place where the, the disruption and the COVID claims would be um, paid out of. Um, but if effectively with a nominal one and a half percent CTR and our estimated COVID um, uh, direct COVID claims, 
of about 0.75%, uh, the effective uh, CTR that's in premiums is 0.8 or 0.75, depending on which way you like to round. Um, and I believe you stated that your belief that 1.5 is, is the minimum necessary uh, CTR that you could request. And, and given that it's at, at the absolute bottom range, why didn't you direct Mr. Schultz to include a greater CTR? The um, outlook for RBC is by nature something that um, is affected by a lot of things uh, beyond our control. So um, as we look at the minimum necessary, um, we Two reasons I, I didn't um, at the time instruct Paul to do something higher than one and a half. One is the hospital budgets, as I had mentioned. Um, we thought that the one and a half was uh, you know, near you know, adequate fairly with what we were expecting for hospital rate increases in their budget requests, but certainly uh, they came in much higher uh, than what we expected. And the other reason is that we you know, until there's a reasonable likelihood that we would not be tar you know, tracking to our target range, um, I would stick. I would choose to stick with the long-term assumption and uh, let those let those um, um, factors play out. Um, could you please briefly explain what policyholder reserves are and why they are important? Um, policyholder reserves are um, what insurance companies are required or mandated by uh, the Department of Finan Financial Regulation to hold to pay claims for our members no matter what. Um, those reserves are um, designed to make sure that uh, we're there to pay the claims um, you know, when, when they're incurred and, and there are uncertainties that have to be uh, covered and uh, we have lots of examples of where we might draw on those reserves and we've talked about those in previous uh, rate hearings um, but clearly the, the the number one reason is the, the claims that might come in higher than uh, we projected or um, maybe there's a uh, state or federal regulation change that is unexpected we had that happen in 2017 when the cost share reductions um, funding was um, stopped and that was after the rate the premiums were in the market. And we also need to draw reserves from time to time when we're investing in new innovative programs like the ones that Paul um, shared earlier today, uh, whether it's um, um, working to find um, more cost-effective ways to deliver generic drugs to the market through Civica Rx or the Vermont Blue Rx program or any of the other um, care management and payment programs uh, that we administer. And then we also um, draw on reserves from time to time when we offer new products to new markets and, and we have a really good example of that. In 2021, we launched the Medicare Advantage um, uh, product line to Vermonters, and um, that that requires reserves. And uh, when also earlier today, it was um, made clear that when we grow membership, it will in the short run uh, reduce RBC, and it's a it's a form of drawing on the reserves. Yeah, and and, and I we. I know we talked a little bit earlier today about the, the effect uh, in different areas that growing membership has on uh, on Blue Cross, but uh, could you explain just in a little more detail why growing membership draws on reserves? Sure. Um, just like losing membership means that the level of risk that we have goes down. When we add membership, the level of risk goes up. So for each member that we add to our roles in uh, each year's enrollment period, um, we are required to hold a certain amount of reserves in order to stay within our, our target range and, and be you know, solvent in the eyes of the Department of Financial Regulation. But when that those new members come on board, our surplus doesn't go up immediately. We do have the, the modest 1.5% CTR, but certainly um, over time that um, surplus will accumulate and the growth, you know, the RBC sort of 
um, levels out later on, but in the short run, it will reduce RBC. Uh, and I'd like to turn uh, to talk a little bit about RBC uh, and uh, specifically whether, uh, if you could explain how Blue Cross develops its RBC. Blue Cross's RBC is a ratio. It's, ex it's, it's basically um, how our reserves compare to the amount of risk that we um, have on the books, so to speak. And the amount of risk is calculated based on the um, methodology that's required by the National Association of Insurance Commissioners, and that's mandated by the Department of Financial Regulation. Uh, and, and could you uh, describe the regulatory requirements that, that govern RBC? Yeah, the, um, the Department of Regulation, as I mentioned in my pre-filed testimony, the Department of Regulation issued an order that um, requires that we target our RBC in the range of 590 to 745%. Um, and what is Blue Cross's current RBC ratio? As of the end of uh, 2021 or um, at December 31st, 2021, our RBC was 607. Um, does DFR monitor uh, that ratio on a regular basis? They do. Uh, we report it regularly, and we also uh, provide DFR with uh, information periodically around the projected RBC. Um, can you turn to uh, Exhibit uh, 19? Um, and I'm also going to ask you about Exhibit 20 in the, in the evidence binder. Okay, I'm at Exhibit 19. And can you just identify what these are for the record? Sure. Exhibit 19 and 20 are the solvency opinions from the Department of Regu uh, Financial Regulation, and uh, Exhibit 19 is the individual rate filing, and Exhibit 20 is for the um, same opinion for the small group rate filing. Is there any substantive difference between the two letters? No, it's the same letter. For both markets. So, or we'll, we'll look at Exhibit 19. Uh, and if you could please turn to page three. Page three, yes. Yes, I'm there. Okay. Uh, and if you would please read the second and third sentences in the paragraph under impact on solvency of proposed rate. DFR does not expect the proposed rate as filed will have a significant impact on our overall system on our overall solvency assessment of Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont. Any downward adjustments to the filings rate components that are not actuarially supported, however, will reduce Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont surplus and negatively impact its solvency. Uh, do you agree with the commissioner's opinion? I do. Uh, on the, on the same page, would you please read the paragraph, uh, the first paragraph under analysis of solvency? DFR considers insurer solvency to be the most fundamental aspect of consumer protection. Determining an insurer's solvency is more complex than whether any given moment the insurer has more assets than liabilities. Rather, it is an intricate analysis of many factors to discern how close the insurer is to insolvency now and in what direction it will move in the future. And do you agree with the commissioner's opinion on that point? Yes. Thank you. Uh, are you prepared to provide additional testimony and answer questions regarding the RBC uh, projections for uh, 22, 2022 and 2023? Yes, I am. Uh, is it appropriate to provide that testimony in public session? No, it is not. And why not? The financial projections for Blue Cross are confidential, commercially sensitive information that provide a business advantage for Blue Cross. And we make reasonable efforts to uh, protect the confidentiality of that information, um, which is important in a competitive marketplace. Thank you. So 
I have uh, no further questions for the public session, although I'll we'll have some additional questions once we move to executive session. Mr. Angoff, do you have questions for the screen? No questions for public session. I do have questions for executive session. Ms. Calavo, do you have any questions for Ms. Green? No, I have no questions. Okay, next we'll go to the board, starting with Member Holmes. Did you say member homes, Mike? I did. I did. Okay. I told on you. Can you speak up a little bit louder? It's sometimes a little, you talk softly, or it might, I can't always quite hear you. Yeah, um, sorry. No worries. Um, well, thank you, Ms. Green. I appreciate your testimony today. Um, my first question is my understanding is that Blue Cross Blue Shield um, assesses facilities for overall quality and patient safety. These are deemed the designated blue distinction centers and also for both quality and efficiency or cost, and those are designated blue distinction center plus facilities. Um, can you talk a little bit about the methodology used to select hospitals for those designations? Um, unfortunately, that's not my area of expertise at a high level. I do know that there is a, a rigorous process and in some, um, some aspects that process is also um, sort of requirements through the blue association so that uh, blue plans throughout the U.S. can have similar um, um, assurances when a member visits one of those centers outside of uh, Vermont, for example. Um, so there is some consistency around that, but I'd be happy to follow up with uh, more detail about that uh, if, if that's something. No, that would be fantastic. Interested be helpful to our, to understand how those designations are determined. Uh, do you know how many Vermont hospitals have achieved either of those designations and for which services? I don't, but I can follow up with that. Um, I do know that it's, um, it's definitely the services that drive the distinction and the facility has to um, meet certain criteria for certain services. So it's not just a hospital and all of the services, it's it's very specific. So um, we can certainly follow up on that. That would be wonderful. I did look a little bit on the website and I noticed that there were not a lot of uh, Vermont hospitals listed um, by services for either of those uh, designations. And so it'd be really helpful to understand why Vermont hospitals are missing from both of those um, designations. Uh, or hospital services, I, I should say, um, particular services that hospitals are not listed. Um, for the hospitals that have received those designations or, you know, for Blue Cross Blue Shield in general, you know, your members, I'm wondering how do you incentivize your members to seek the care at those designated high quality, low cost facilities? Once they've been designated, does Blue Cross Blue Shield Vermont do anything to um, encourage its members to seek care at those designated facilities. Again, I'm not uh, the the right person to know the details of how this works, but I, I do know that um, we have certain, um, you know, certain of our clients really like the blue distinction aspect, especially if they have members uh, who are out of state, um, and um, certainly our service organization is familiar with the blue distinction areas and, and can help people find them. Um, but I, you know, we don't have a, um, to my knowledge, and I'll follow up on this to see if, see, um, you know, if it varies perhaps by blue distinction service uh, facilities. Um, but to my knowledge, we don't, quote, drive business to them, um, but it is certainly an option for our members. But would you agree that driving members to those low cost, high quality hospitals would reduce costs to all members and reduce future premiums? Yes, um, any any facility or provider that's considered high quality, lower cost, the more our members use them, 
the more effective and cost um, cost effective the coverage would be. Okay. Um, July 1st was actually the deadline for insurance companies to upload machine readable files related to negotiated prices of healthcare services. At least that's my understanding. Um, what do you think we will all collectively learn about that data and how can Blue Cross Blue Shield leverage that data in its negotiations to make healthcare more affordable for Vermonters? Yeah, the, um, as we know, the, the other efforts that were mentioned earlier today about providing consistent um, information about the cost of uh, certain services can often uh, initially create more questions than it answers just because everyone's um, digesting what's out there. Um, we believe that the machine readable files are, are really um, the power in that Regulation is through the, the member oriented cost tra cost transparency tools so that people will know the costs up front and be able to sort of participate more proactively in uh, where they get their care and, and um, prevent surprises, et cetera. So, um, you know, I, I know that uh, Lou McLaren and some of our contracting folks has talked to the board about what information they were able to glean from the the previous round of information, but the machine readable files is really um, designed for um, uh, providing the data for some of the uh, member facing tools so that they can navigate the healthcare system more seamlessly. So do you have plans on then um, doing anything with those member facing tools as a result of that data? Yeah, we have a cost transparency um, capability, and I think the team, the technology, and the team that works on that is is uh, looking at you know how that can be improved over time with with the newer developments in data that's available, and frankly, the the um, um, the industry of of technology firms that are um, working on different um, tools is changing constantly. So we're looking at certain types of tools for certain types of services and things. Okay, my last question is um, on exhibit 14 pages five through nine. In that, on the, in those pages, um, you outline a set of programs in place to reduce low value care. Yeah. Um, many programs there. Yeah. Do you assess the turn on investment on these programs or in effect, do you assess the member savings per dollar per month uh, spent on these programs? Yeah, all of our programs. I just want to be careful that we don't get into anything confidential in this line of questions or about to move into executive session. Good point, good point. Um, I, can, I think I can safely respond uh, as we have in previous hearings that um, all of our programs are reviewed on a periodic basis, and and uh, when a new program comes along, it has to compete with you know the resourcing uh, that we have, and uh, we'll often be looking at the effectiveness of the programs that are in place, and then if a new program is more effective, we'll we'll make some trade offs, or in some cases we'll we'll say well we'll add something to it, but there is a um, an ongoing review of how our Cost containment and quality and low value care programs are um, running. You know, are they are they providing the benefit? Because um, things can change too over time, so they need to be looked at periodically. Okay, I might follow up in the confidential uh, executive session. But thank you very much. That's all I have. Thank you. Walsh, do you have questions from the screen? Board member Walsh, do you have questions for Ruth? Member Pelham? Hi. Um, <clears throat> so I just, I have a, you know, my mic's on. I have a, uh, just a question, because I'm trying to get a sense of scale here. Um, between, so I'm looking at 4% as it relates to administration and 1.5% um, as it relates to CTR. And I'm wondering what are the two numbers in dollars? 
So if there was a 4% increase in administration, what what's the dollar value of that? Um, and similarly for CTR, because my guess is CTR would be bigger than the administration, but it, but the percentages are, are, are not up aligned. And I mean, I do know from your SURF filing that for the small group, the premium increase is 18.6 million uh, at the 12 12.5% 12 uh, rate increase level. And for the uh, individual market, it's 19.5 million at the 12.3%. Uh, so I'm just, I'm just trying to get a sense of, here's the up, combined is $38 million. And then down the line um, for administration, uh, this is the call on that. And uh, down the line for CTR, uh, this is the call on that, just to kind of uh, ha have perspective. Sure. The 1.5% uh, the CTR, I'll take that one first. Um, so in each rate filing, the total premium charged, um, which is on that same exhibit, um, not just the increase, but the total premium charged, the CTR of one and a half percent for the small group business is two and a half million. Um, two and a half, and, right? And then the um, for the individual, it's about the same, two point seven million. That's one and a half CTR. Whereas um, four percent on admin, um, the the um, well, there's a couple of ways to look at it. We've talked in the past. Uh, I have handy. Um, we've talked in the past of what the impact of a 1% salary increase would be, and that is um, um, very small in terms of percentage of premium. It's less than, I think it's 1.2% 1, 1 less than 2 twentieths of 1% uh, for premiums. But mm -hmm. I can um, give you one moment and... Um, yeah, why don't you do that? Tell you, I, the, so the, the four percent administrative cost would be around three million, give or take. Three million, yeah. So you so you have both salary and then administration. Right, it's all in there. Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, I'll look forward to the to the detail a bit. This gives does give me a sense of scale here. Thank you. Okay, board member Lunch. Thank you. Um, while we're on the topic of administration, so in prior years, um, typically you you do mention a 3% salary increase. And to be frank, I can't remember sort of the general administrative increase year over year, but it sounds like um, that's information that we'll be able to get uh, from uh, Jess's previous question. Um, so can you talk a little bit about the basis for the 4% administrative increase? I, uh, your filing indicates inflation. Can you be more specific? Sure. So um, when we submitted the filing, and certainly for the, for the first part of 2022, there was, um, as we all have experienced, sort of an increasing rate of inflation, which um, is really and still remains to be seen how long that sticks around for. And certainly the Federal Reserve had to begin taking pretty significant action to uh, raise interest rates to, to bring that inflation um, under control. So we, we debated whether or not we should be thinking for 2023, as we are just going into our budgeting season now for 2023, we thought our previous assumption of um, 3% on salaries and 0%, i.e. keep everything else non-salary flat, was going to be um, a goal or a target that wasn't practical to meet in 2023, given the current inflationary pressures. So while at the same time, we also believe that the Federal Reserve will get this under control and um, we don't believe that there's a, a long-term risk of um, this very high inflation, um, but we felt that it was important for us to plan for um, salary increases um, somewhat higher than what we had uh, between the freeze that we did in 2021, where we froze uh, salary folks, salaries at you know, no increase at all, and then the labor market 
speeded up and uh, the ability to attract and retain people has become um, very much a front and center issue for us. So uh, we felt like uh, we needed to uh, be planning for something higher, but we also recognize that um, we pride ourselves on keeping our cost efficiency in the place where it, it helps our, our customers and our members. So we, we didn't go above the 4%. We just felt like it was premature to go too much higher than that. So what is your salary assumption? Right now, we're um, the filing includes 4%, but we're still working on exactly what it should be. We're, we're looking at where the um, retention risks are in our business for some of the more um, expert uh, resources that we frankly would, would pay a lot more to replace them. So we're, we're having a look at where those opportunities to uh, make sure that we're um, keeping the people that uh, really make Blue Cross work. What's your vacancy rate? We had um, very low turnover up until this last couple of years. Uh, when we froze our pension plan, we had uh, a number of folks uh, choose that as a catalyst to retire. And we've also um, seen with the remote working environment, people can live in Vermont and enjoy Vermont and work for companies elsewhere. So we've had an uptick in our turnover and um, you know, I haven't looked at the rate recently, but in 2021, I think it was well north of 20%. We are having trouble hiring folks as well. So I do know that we have, at any given point in time, we have about 20, 20 vacancies on a base of about 400. But that goes up and down um, sure. depending on the timing. So the 20% was from 2021. Yeah, no, let me um, take that back and, and pull an act through, you know, not me just um, remembering from the last report I looked at. I'd like to provide you with that information. Great, thank you. Um, and in terms of uh, outside of flat salaries and benefits, uh, what are the other types of administrative expenses and that inflation would impact? And, for example, I would assume that some of your contracts uh, may be in place and may last for multiple years and wouldn't necessarily rise or fall with inflation. But could you give me a sense of what those other costs are? Sure, you're, you're absolutely right. The other costs are, in fact, um, the contracts that we have for, you know, the, the, for instance, um, AIM, I'm trying to remember what it stands for, but our, our uh, our image, advanced imaging management uh, contract um, would be increasing or any of the, the contracted resources that we um, use when we need to uh, you know, develop a new capability. Sometimes we hire in contracted resources for that. But yes, so all of our, con we don't, I'd say our Microsoft contract for the base like laptop and network is a multi-year contract, but beyond that, a lot of the other contracts are um, one year because it usually would work to our favor to not have uh, long-term contracts um, when inflation wasn't uh, so rampant. But uh, we are definitely fighting that same fight that everyone is trying to, to keep our vendors' um, rate increases in, in check during this time. Thank you. Um, so uh, going back to um, the administrative costs being spread over fewer people, um, you mentioned a few minutes ago, part of that is a shift of um, some folks from one platform to another. Is that the Medicare Advantage uh, situation that Mr. Schultz had testified to earlier? Yeah, that's one of them. We have um, We have a couple of different partnership platforms, Medicare Advantage is one. We also have um, a TPA that uh, does a blue branded um, uh, ASO service. And whenever membership shifts between the different platforms, it means the fixed costs of those platforms have to be shared by uh, the membership that's remaining. And in the case of Medicare Advantage, um, we were very successful 
in 2021, um, out of the gate in year one, we had um, one of our large group um, clients move their retirees onto the platform, which was um, very good from uh, their point of view. They were saving lots of money um, by doing that. And uh, so the growth on the Medicare Advantage Book of Business meant um, contraction on the, the previous core, if you will, um, Blue Cross platform. So on the core platform, in addition to the QHPs, is it the large group members or are there additional books of business in that core platform? Yeah, I, it's, it's interesting. Most of our other businesses are on that core platform with the exception of our Part D um, um, Medicare uh, pharmacy offering. But uh, our federal employee program, the large group, large group ASO, QHP, um, I'm sure I'm missing one or two, Med Medicare supplement, those are all on the core legacy systems. So as we grow those businesses, um, as we said earlier today, that pendulum will swing. Okay. Thank you very much. That's all I have. Mr. Chair, do you have questions? Yes. Um, Ruth, when do you expect to get an answer from um, the uh, federal agency on whether or not you'll be able to uh, revert some of the funds that you had had to advance to the pension back to uh, your reserves. Yeah, so um, the real good news is uh, we our pension trust has received um, a partial settlement from the uh, litigation against Allianz and um, at year end when the pension valuation happens those uh, the benefit of those recoveries will show up in our financial statements. The federal um, Department of Labor action that you uh, mentioned is um, they need to approve an exemption for an agreement that said that it, should we recover those funds, will the cash actually come back into Blue Cross's um, uh, investment portfolio? And that's what we're awaiting. And uh, it's it's kind of a dare I say, kind of a fickle process. It kind of moves quickly and then we don't hear anything for weeks at a time. So um, we thought we were real close back in March and uh, it's been quiet now, but I do expect that to be resolved um, yet this year. But irrespective of that, um, the value of that, those assets coming back into the pension trust will benefit um, Blue Cross. In, is there any recent news as far as the uh, rest of the actions? Because that was just a piece. Yeah, the other piece is moving along in a in a positive way. Um, but I, I we can certainly um, uh, talk more about it in executive session. But um, that other piece is is moving. That's all I had, Mr. Hearing Officer. Battles any redirect on the public, the public stuff? Uh, no, I think we're ready to move to executive session if everyone else is. Okay. So, um, you guys have been <laughs> through this before, with the exception of uh, Board Member Walsh, but um, there's typically two grounds that arise in these types of proceedings for going into executive session. Um, first one, the board can go into executive session to take testimony on documents uh, and portions of documents that have been determined to be confidential. So all the blue highlighted material in the binder has already been determined to be confidential through, through our process um, under our rules and we have an obligation to keep that material confidential, which we can do in an executive session. Um, the caveat there is that that exemption to the Open Meetings Act, or sorry, that that provision of the executive sec session statute doesn't permit a discussion of the e exempt portion of a record to extend to the general topic. So for example, um, 
the unit cost assumptions in the filing that have been determined to be confidential doesn't wouldn't permit you to go into uh, to discuss contracting in general in the executive session. There is a separate section of the executive session statute that uh, allows you to go into executive session to talk about um, contracts provided that you found uh, that public knowledge of the information discussed would place a person at a substantial disadvantage. So I've heard throughout the day that both of those grounds may be at play. So it sounds like people have questions about the confidential material in the binders, which would include the RBC projections, um, maybe some unit cost information. I've also heard uh, what I think there may be questions about provider contracting uh, expectations in general. And so I think to, to cover both of those grounds, you need to uh, kind of in, include both of those grounds in the motion. Um, so <clears throat> any questions about that? I can propose some motion language if, if you'd like, and then you can ask me questions about that. Um, uh, but it so would anyone like to move that the board <clears throat> find that public knowledge of uh, the details of Blue Cross's provider contract negotiations would place Blue Cross at a disadvantage, substantial disadvantage? I will move that the board find that public knowledge of the details of Blue Cross's provider contract ne negotiations would place Blue Cross at a substantial disadvantage. Is there a second to that motion? I will second it. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Thank you. Uh, please let, let the record reflect that was unanimous. Um, and then the second motion I, I'm suggesting is, uh, would, would you like to make a motion to go into executive session to take testimony about the details of contract negotiations between Blue Cross and healthcare providers and um, material in the binders that's been marked as confidential? I would like to move we go into executive session to take testimony about the details of contract negotiations be between Blue Cross and healthcare providers and to discuss uh, information that's been marked confidential in the exhibits and binders. Second. Been moved and seconded. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Just let the record reflect that was unanimous as well. Um, so before we go into executive session, um, I just want to caution the attorneys and the board that this needs to be limited to those topics that were identified, um, and that, uh, any, anything outside of that will need to be, um, in the public session. Um, as far as uh, who comes to the executive session, so um, it would need to be obviously the board members, the attorneys, uh, Ms. Green and Mr. Schultz, I think we identified. Um, I think l &E needs to be there as well as uh, DFR, uh, since we will be talking about the RBC. I think it would be helpful if they were there to hear that. Um, any anyone that I'm not that I missed that should be in the executive session. Uh, thank you. We would ask that uh, Martine uh, be allowed to participate as well. Okay. Yeah, I'm thinking everyone from. And, our, and Rebecca Hines. 
And, and I believe Greg is on the line too. So I guess the, you know our legal and actuarial team, we would like to be able to listen in. Anyone from Blue Cross? Anyone from the healthcare advocate? Um, board included, LNE, DFR, uh, and obviously the court reporter. Um, Mr. Lee, is it possible to transcribe the executive session uh, separately? Yeah, I believe so. Would be appreciated. Anything that I'm not that I'm forgetting here before we move into the executive session? Do we need to make an estimate of time for how long we will be in executive session for folks? Yeah, that would be helpful. Um, so I heard uh, ben has some direct for Mrs. Green, and you all have some cross on that uh, for Mrs. Green. And then I think there was some cross left over for Mr. Schultz. So I'm expecting 30 to 45 minutes. Is that, does that sound? I would also, Mike, I have probably five or six questions that could be as much as I don't know, 20 minutes, so maybe an hour. Because I, I know Jess also asked a question that got deferred to executive session. And I don't know if other folks have questions. So I, I know that, uh, you know, people will want the opportunity for closing statements, uh, Mike, but I was just wondering if it made any sense at all to have um, DFR testify in open session before we go into uh, private session? Um, I think it, I'd like to hear the party's thoughts on this, but uh, I'd, I'd, they're giving an opinion about the impact on, on solvency and I think potentially uh, questions around the RBC projections and, and stuff might be relevant to that. So I'd prefer to keep the order as, as it is. Okay. Happy to defer to however you'd like to proceed. Well, I say we, Christina, if you could post a on on this channel a notice that we are in executive session we expect to come back uh at four and we'll try and make that happen Great. okay i think we're all here uh we're back on record in the blue cross and blue shield of vermont's 2023 individual and small group rate filing hearing we've just come out of an executive session uh, to talk about um, confidential materials and the binders and um, I think we're ready to move on to testimony from the Department of Financial Regulation um, so Jesse Lucier I see you're with us are you prepared to take the oath yes can you hear me okay yes we can hear you could you please raise your right hand? Uh, do you solemnly swear that the evidence you shall give relative to the cause under consideration shall be the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Okay. Then uh, in, uh, proceed as in past years. All right. Um, my name is Jesse Lucher. I work for the Vermont Department of Financial Regulation. Uh, I've been there for 11 years. Uh, I'm the lead analyst for Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont. Um, during the course of an analysis, uh, it involves uh, reviewing quarterly financial statements, and then uh, year end, there's a there's a very robust financial package that includes financial statements, audited financial statements. 
uh, various exhibits, actuarial opinions um, that we use to incorporate our full solvency opinion. Um, I am going to just read parts of the solvency opinion that we issued for the individual rate filing. Um, as you can see, we've included the uh, the RBC ratio over the last five years and the company surplus, uh, both of which have increased since the previous years. And uh, as we've noted, Blue Cross, uh, their RBC ratio is now uh, within the range, um, although it is at the, the bottom end of the range. And as we've discussed before, uh, Blue Cross expects the uh, RBC ratio to stay kind of kind of close to the to the bottom uh, for the next year or two. Um, I'm just going to go straight down to the impact uh, on the solvency of the proposed rate uh, section on the bottom of page three and read that for everybody. Uh, DFR does not expect the proposed rate as filed will have a significant impact on our overall solvency assessment of Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont. Any downward adjustments to the filings rate components that are not actuarially supported, however, will reduce Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont's surplus and negatively impact solvency. Um, the first sentence notes that the uh, individual filing rate was 12.3%. The small group filing reads the same, except that it notes it's 12.5% of an average uh, rate increase. Um, I know we've discussed this before, that Blue Cross has updated their filing, which is noted in Exhibit 30, and those rates are 14.9% and 15.4%. Um, I don't believe that our opinion will change with those updated uh, numbers with the caveat that uh, uh, Lewis and Ellis, um, the, the care board's actuary, reviews the uh, the amendments uh, or the updates and opines that they are are reasonable. Um, and with that, because I know we're kind of short on time, I will uh, turn it back over to you, Mike. Thanks. Mr. Leisher, uh, Mr. Battles, do you have questions for DFR? Um, I, I don't have questions. Thank you, Mr. Leisher. Mr. Angoff, do you have questions? I can't hear you. You're on mute. If Ben doesn't have questions, I don't have questions. Does any board member have questions for Mr. Leisher? Okay, thank you, Mr. Leisher. Thank you. Okay, next on the agenda is Mike Fisher. Here I am. Are you ready, Mr. Fisher? I am. Okay, could you please raise your right hand? Let me find my oath. I'm not used to giving it. Uh, do you solemnly swear that the evidence you shall give relative to the cause under consideration shall be the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes. Go ahead. Um, so thank you uh, for listening to me at the end of the day, at the end of this long day. It's been great spending the day with you all. Um, let's do it again in two days. Um, and uh, and thank you, board members, for your thoughtful consideration of the really difficult decisions in front of you. Thank you in advance. Um, I was heartened by this year's public comments. To me, they represented a higher quality than I think we've seen in previous years. I was impressed by their overall level of understanding of the complexity and their thoughtfulness and, and their reasonableness. Um, I know that um, that board members take pride in reading uh, all the materials in front of you and the public comments, um, but I want to take a moment to highlight some themes that I saw this year. Um, and read it and read excer excerpts from a few comments. Um, many people this year talked about this proposed rate increase in the context of overall inflation. One person said, I understand that healthcare costs are rising. They were rising even before the pandemic, 
What concerns me is that every company and institution in the chain is allowed to protect their profits and to pass their costs on to individuals who are already overburdened by the rising costs of living. Another person said, a double digit price increase will be devastating. Families already struggling to buy food and put gas in their vehicles to get to work will make the painful choice to drop their insurance. Quite a few Vermonters commented about the proposed rate increase in the context of availability of care. When I do need to see a doctor, it's months before I can get an appointment. I've been on wait lists for mental health for almost a year. The person went on to wonder, an increase of 12% would be such a serious, serious would be, <laughs> would have a seriously considering if it's even worth having health insurance anymore. It truly doesn't feel worth it. By the way, that reminds me, um, many Vermonters, most Vermonters commented about the originally proposed rates, not the uh, in, in increased rates. They didn't have an opportunity to. So I, I don't know exactly how we reflect that, but um, many Vermonters talked about this in the dynamic of their employer. Uh, from the small business perspective, I uh, can't afford it as a small business owner and employer of seven. We will be forced to reduce the benefits and employee contributions will be higher. From the municipal perspective, an increase of 12 to 15 percent would be hugely damaging to both our municipal government finance as well as our small rural elementary school and its employees. And from the nonprofit perspective, People who work for nonprofits are paid low wages and Vermont wages do not keep up with the cost of living. With, with the cost of living increasing at this rate, this will create financial hardships for so many people. And, and one more on this. My family of three includes a toddler with a rare condition who has upwards of 50 medical appointments per year. That's before anything goes wrong. We rely on our high quality plan with Blue Cross Blue Shield to make their ongoing care possible and need low deductible plan. Purchasing my insurance through a nonprofit employer who would not be able to absorb the increased costs. Uh, quite a few people commented about the proposed rates with reference to their pay not going up. I think I won't read any comments about that. I think people know it. We heard comments today. We heard comments this year about from caregivers. Who who talked about um, what this rate will do to their ability to provide care. Potentially exacerbating. The challenges of, of finding care, mental health care and others. And finally, there are many commenters this year expressed what I think was a higher level of desperation. I'm a semi-retired educator laid off from my full time job of many years in 2021. I depend depend on my Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont insurance for chronic for a chronic condition. A rate increase of any amount would leave me unable to afford in insurance. Simply put, I must have insurance given my, given my medical con condition, yet would be unable to pay any more than I pay now. And another person said, please don't do this. Don't raise my rate 12.3% just because, well, everybody else is doing it. Very soon, I will have to decide what to cut out, cut out of my budget. If I have to cut our health insurance, our health care insurance, and if I end up in the hospital and can't pay their bill, who will pay for it for me? Please balance your rate hike so I can have the dignity, dignity of paying my own bills. So Vermonters are telling us just as clearly as they can that the proposed rates are out of range for them. Um, that if they go into effect, they will have very tough decisions in the context of overall inflationary challenges on their families, the difficulties of getting care due to availability of appointments, the dynamics facing their employers, their experiences of stagnation of real wages, 
and their feelings of desperation. And at the HCA, we talk to enough people who have very significant health care needs in their family, but who just can't pay the premiums, let alone their cost sharing. For them, all of the choices are unaffordable by any definition. The initially proposed rates for a family of four purchasing a standard silver just above 400% of the federal poverty level, according to current law, would be expected to pay over 25% of their income for premiums, a quarter. That's before any cost sharing. I'm reminded of a concept that, um, uh, uh, that from a number of years ago, um, that an actuarially sound insurance rate that only Bill Gates and Warren Buffett could afford is not the goal here. I'm scratching the back of my brain a little bit, but I, I get a little flash of Cliff Peterson, for those who have been around this business for a long time, um, saying that in the discussion about our current structure. So the board has options. Um, I know you can't sa satisfy everyone, um, but we believe that you can land on a rate that is not excessive, inadequate, or unfairly discriminatory, but is more affordable for Vermonters. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Fisher. Mr. Battles, do you have any questions, Mr. Fisher, on that? Uh, no, I don't, I don't uh, have any questions for Cross. Does any board member have any questions for Mr. Fisher? OK, well, I think that concludes the witness testimony for today. Um, give uh, both parties an opportunity for brief closing statements. Mr. Battles, would you like to make closing statements? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Barber, uh, and I will, I will keep it short as I know it's been a long day. Uh, I'd just like to close out by emphasizing a few points that have been discussed. And, and first and foremost, uh, what I started out talking about and, and what I'll return to now is, is, the, is the cost of health care is, is expensive and it's getting more so in the short term. And there's, there's no getting around that fact. Um, the rates we are requesting today are directly attributable to that cost. More than 90% of the premiums uh, we are requesting will go towards the cost of paying for health care for Vermonters. Um, and as long as those costs are increasing, uh, the cost of coverage uh, is increasing as well. Uh, Mr. Fisher just read some you know, very uh, moving comments for members of the public, and uh, they clearly reflect the difficulty of, of the current situation. I think they also reflect the, the inherent tension of this process and of the, of the board's job here too, where uh, you have um, you know, concerns about costs, certainly you also have concerns about access and quality of care for, for people with special needs. And that's, uh, and that's the tension in this process. So you know, we, a number of witnesses have talked about it and the board is well aware of it. And, uh, and uh, you know, that's, you know, Blue Cross has tried to address that tension as well and propose rates that uh, they believe uh, strike the appropriate balance. Um, and I talked about the 90% of, of the cost of the premiums which go to uh, direct health care costs and the, the remaining 9 or 10% uh, go to taxes and fees and the cost of insurance. Uh, Taxes and fees are, are what they are, and, and there's nothing that uh, is going to be changed about that in this proceeding. Um, Blue Cross does have discretion, and, and the board uh, does as well, over the administrative expenses and the, the contributions to reserves. You've heard today from Mr. Schultz and Ms. Green how we have allocated those uh, the revenue to those costs uh, and the important purposes that we put that money toward, including our efforts to, to reform and improve the healthcare care system. Uh, to pay pandemic related costs and to protect our solvency as we are legally required to do. Uh, and you have heard how both LE and 
and the Department of Financial Regulation agree that our allocation of, of those costs of insurance uh, are reasonable. Uh, finally, I would just like to emphasize today that the areas of, of agreement uh, really outweigh the areas of, of disagreement. Um, there is no real dispute that the, the rate requests today are, are being driven by health care costs. Um, uh, the board's actuaries at Ellen Agree have agreed with, with the majority of the rate development work performed by Mr. Schultz and his team. And DFR agrees that Blue Cross must protect its solvency and that the requester rates do so, and that any decrease from the requester rates would place that solvency at risk. Uh, and in the small area of actuarial disagreement that we, that we have with Lewis and Alice, we have explained our methodology and assumptions and why they are reasonable. Uh, and our responses to Eleni's questions in uh, Mr. Schultz's pre-file testimony and his live testimony here today. And we stand by our work on, on that score. Um, but and although we spend a, t a lot of time discussing that, that one point of disagreement, uh, it is a relatively small part of the overall picture and uh, it should not overshadow the other areas of agreement that, uh, that I've highlighted. Um, Blue Cross's final requested rates for the 2023 individual and small markets, small group markets are reasonable and they are actuarially supported. They strike the best available balance between affordability, promoting quality care and access to care, and protecting insurer solvency. Respectfully request that they be approved. Uh, on behalf of Blue Cross, I want, I want to thank everyone in the room today uh, for their time and for your work throughout the process, of course, including the board and its team and Everyone from the healthcare advocate and uh, Mr. Lucier uh, from DFR and, and, and the members of public who took the time to provide uh, public comments and listen into the hearing today. Thank you. Mr. Angoff, would you like to make closing statements? Yes, I would. Thank you, Mr. Hearing Officer, and thank you, Mr. Chair and board members. Four points is that. They've got a duty to their policyholders to do that. If they don't, what value do they bring? If you're just going to go to set the hospital rate and, the, and they don't negotiate with the hospitals and the people have to pay it, Blue Cross is simply serving the function of an old fashioned uh, pass through mechanism. And I thought that I thought that we'd gotten beyond that that I mean, both the carriers and the hospitals are going to kill the golden goose. The rate for the silver plan is already, without any increase today, is already almost 800 bucks. And that's not for a tremendously generous plan. That's for a 70% actuarial value plan, almost 800 bucks a month. I think Mike Fisher said that was 25, uh, 25% of, I forget what statistic he used, but it's uh, to their credit, neither Blue Cross nor L&E said they were opining on, on affordability. And they shouldn't. That's the board's job. So my first point is that they, they, they just, Blue Cross has got to be more than a pass-through mechanism. And by reducing the rate, the board would be not just doing the public a favor, but also be doing Blue Cross a favor in negotiating with the hospitals. Because Blue Cross would be able to go to the hospital and say, listen, we got no choice. And so uh, if, if the board were to reduce the rate, it would benefit Blue Cross, the hospitals, and the public. Second point, I was also struck by Ms. Green's admission that for other types of business, Blue Cross does not tack on a 1.5% CTR. For their MA business, their medical advantage business, it's 1% for Blue Cross. And for the uh, the ASO, the large group ASO business, not only is there no CTR, uh, no positive CTR, CTR provision, but there's a negative CTR provision. So it just seems perverse that 
they're charging individuals and small groups this extra 1.5%, and they're not charging uh, other types of business that 1.5%. I'm going to stick, st skip my third point and go right to my last point, which is good news. And the good news is this. The board has the ability to change things. As I said, not very eloquently in my opening, excessive, inadequate, and unfairly discriminatory is just one of many standards in the statute you have to work with. And it's an almost unique statute in the country. In most states, that is the standard. And people argue about whether the rate's unfair, whether the rate meets that standard, and it's set based on that standard. But here it's different. What the board, what I'm urging the board to do, and I think the board can do it this year, and can certainly do it in the future, is ask l &E not to replicate, essentially, you know, go through the filing and come up with their own actuarial point estimate. And by the way, what, what when uh, Mr. Battle says that Blue Cross and l and &E have agreed on most things. No, they haven't. What, what, what l and &E has agreed on, the standard that l and &E uses, is not whether Blue Cross has come to the, uh, the best estimate of what excessive, inadequate, and unfairly discriminatory rate is, but simply, is it a reasonable estimate? And sometimes the only time on occasion they find it's not even reasonable. It's not even within that zone of reasonableness. But if the board were simply to ask l &E, give us a range for all these elements and then the board as to what's within the not excessive, not inadequate range. And then the board has the authority to say, based on the other criteria, for example, what's affordable? Here is the number we're going to pick within that range. That is how the statute can. Uh, that that's the only way for the statute to make sense, and interpreted in that way. I think the board would be doing a great service. I also think Vermont would set an example for the rest of the country uh, by carrying out the statute its statutory duty that way. Thank you again. Uh, I appreciate everybody's patience with uh, my occasional long windedness. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ango. So I think we are done with uh, the hearing portion of uh, today and need to move to public comment if there is any. So if is there any member of the public who's with us who would like to comment on uh, the hearing or the filings or, or anything. Um, you are on teams if you just want to take yourself off mute and. Um, provide your comment. Don't see anyone other than the parties on the attendee list. Um, Let's just remind everybody about the uh, official public hearing. Yep, I just want to check. Uh, Christina, is there anyone at the board's large conference room? No, no one is here at the office. OK. Um, so if there is anyone on, uh, like I said at the beginning of the hearing today, uh, we will be um, having a, a public comment forum hearing this Thursday from four o'clock to six o'clock. Um, details about how to uh, attend that and, and participate can be found on our website uh, by going to the rate review tab. Um, and obviously you can continue submitting comments and writing um, to the board uh, through this Thursday. 
on, on this filing and the filing from MVP. So, um, I think there's just one or two uh, minor things that we probably want to um, touch base on before we wrap up today. Uh, I heard a number of questions that uh, there were follow up on that was needed, so we will work over the next day or two to compile those and get them out to you in writing. Um, it sounded like there was also maybe a question to be asked around the hospital budget <clears throat> assumptions and calculations um, and potentially uh, a notice of um, facts, uh, judicially noticed facts. Uh, that should all be coming in the next couple days or is potentially coming in the, in the next couple days. Any questions about that or anything we need to talk to about um, with respect to those issues? Um, now, the only thing I, I just wanted to mention in our pre-hearing conference, uh, the issue of a of the page limit for a post-hearing memorandum came up and I just want to note that um, so you had promised to be prompt about that. I'll confer with uh, the client group and, and make a request within the uh, next day or so. If there's one. Okay. Anything from the HCA's perspective? No, thank you very much. Okay, thank you uh, for your attention today and I'll turn it back over to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mike, and uh, thank you for getting through a long day. Um, as always, an outstanding job as hearing officer. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. So moved. Second. It's been moved and second to, to adjourn. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, signify by saying nay. Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of the day.